Welcome to Volcanism and Other Igneous Processes. This first slide that you're seeing uh, here is the uh, uh, volcanic eruption of Mount St. Helens, which is located in the southwestern portion of uh, Washington State. And uh, this occurred in 1980. And this particular volcanic eruption is significant because it really is one of the only volcanic eruptions that's taken place in the last uh, 100 years uh, within the continental uh, United uh, States. So let me read you a little bit about the Mount St. Helens eruption before we begin here. It says here on Sunday, May 18th, 1980, the largest volcanic eruption to occur in North American historic times transformed a picturesque volcano into a, a decapitated remnant. On this date in southwestern Washington state, Mount St. Helens erupted with tremendous force. And here you see a picture of Mount St. Helens before the eruption, before May 18th, 1980. And here is now a picture of Mount St. Helens after the eruption, of course, May 18th, 1980. And then over here to your right-hand side is the uh, Washington State map. And it shows you the location of uh, Mount St. Helens, which is located in the Cascade Mountain Range. So what happened? Well, approximately one cubic kilometer of ash erupted into the Earth's atmosphere. And if you think about this, this is actually quite a bit because you can take a cubic uh, kilometer, which is one kilometer by one kilometer by one kilometer length times length times width times height. And that's how much ash erupted into the atmosphere. The summit of Mount St. Helens decreased by about 1,350 feet. It claimed 59 lives. Ash propelled 11 miles into the atmosphere, uh, which resulted in ash covering surrounded areas of Yakima, uh, the Tri-Cities, and Northern Oregon for about three days. And so when we say Northern Oregon, we're talking about the Portland area. Tri-Cities is over by the eastern side of uh, Washington State. Again, ash covered those areas for three days. So really during that three days, noon felt like night. And because of that, we have an interesting statistics. So let's go down to the last bullet point. And it says February 1981. So that's about nine months after May 18th, 1980. And within this uh, area, the highest birth rate in Portland and surrounding areas. And that's a true fact. And if you think about it, you know, if, if uh, you know, days felt like nights, what else do you do? Advice from the authorities read towards the lower part of the uh, screen. If there is another major eruption, put your head between your legs and kiss your ash goodbye. Little uh, volcanic humor there. So in this um, discussion on volcanism and igneous uh, features and igneous processes, we're gonna look at the concept of viscosity. And we're gonna find out that this term viscosity, which describes how material or liquids behave, really dictates uh, um, why we have certain kind of volcanoes and why we have certain types of lavas and so forth. Uh, we'll look at lava types. And so there's a certain types of lavas that are associated with uh, uh, various types of volcanoes. We'll look at the types of volcanoes um, that are produced or three significant types uh, that we'll look at uh, that we can see all over on the Earth's surface. And then we'll look at some volcanic uh, associated features with various types of volcanoes. And then finally, we'll talk about uh, living with volcanoes on Earth uh, with respect to uh, volcanic hazards. So the buzzword is viscosity. And really, we need to get a really good understanding uh, what is meant by this term viscosity. And viscosity really uh, looks at the uh, behavior of liquids. And so I have two distinct liquids here on the screen. It looks like uh, one liquid represents molasses um, and the other liquid on the lower part of your uh, right hand part of the screen would be water. And really what viscosity describes is how well material flows. Um, and we've all experienced various types of liquids uh, in, our, in our lives. Some liquids are um, very slow moving. Uh, some liquids uh, are very fast moving. And really again, what you're looking at um, is again, the, the, how the material flows. And so when we look at something that's very high viscosity, or we'd say more viscous, 
um, it flows very slowly. And so in terms of this picture you see here of the molasses, as you pour molasses under room temperature, it basically creeps out or moves very slowly out of the container. Another good example of uh, high viscosity is, believe it or not, peanut butter. Uh, if we allowed peanut butter to, to, if we could hold peanut butter with the lid off and you can help hold it for several minutes, you up to an hour, um, eventually the peanut butter will uh, flow. So we'd say peanut butter does have a high viscosity. Then on the other hand, we can have a material in which we would describe as low viscosity or moves and flows very quickly. So this would be a less viscous material. And in this case, I'm showing you a picture of water, which is low viscosity. Uh, gasoline would be another um, example of something that's very low viscosity. So we're going to take this concept of viscosity and we're going to look at how viscosity then uh, influences a volcano. It influences the type of lava that's emitted from a volcano, uh, influences the structure or type of volcano as well. Does glass have viscosity? And if you kind of look at glass, it doesn't look like it's moving. But in fact, glass does have viscosity and glass does move. Uh, glass is very, very, very high viscosity. In fact, if you um, ever get a chance, I think we talked about this in previous discussions, but if you get a chance to ever visit a ghost town and the buildings, which are in excess of 100 years old, for example, um, um, and have the original windows, you can kind of look at the windows and the windows kind of show a wave type uh, structure associated with the window, it kind of looks wavy. And that's because the window has been flowing. And so um, the window flows from top to bottom, which gives it that wavy look. So glass does flow and glass would be a very considered an extremely very high viscous material. So why do volcanoes have different eruptive styles? And again, we're going to equate this now to uh, viscosity and some compositions of different types of lavas. So factors influencing eruptions. Well, it's very dependent on, again, the magma's viscosity. Uh, if you have something that's very high viscosity, uh, the lava could be considered what we term as very pasty, which, uh, very, uh, which uh, primarily uh, uh, equals a very explosive type eruption. If you have something with low viscosity, uh, low viscosity would uh, be equated to very fluid type movement of lava. And so this particular lava would flow easily. So if, if viscosity is a huge factor uh, with respect to volcano type and uh, types of uh, volcanic eruptions, what factors then influence a viscosity? Well, how about temperature? Temperature of the magma or in this case, temperature of the lava. So for example, if the temperature is high, so we can, uh, Earth can be able to heat the magma up to very high temperatures, then viscosity becomes very low and uh, one can observe and see fluid type flow, so it moves pretty fast. Then on the other hand, if temperature is low, uh, viscosity can become very high, which could be, uh, um, equal to more or less a pasty uh, type flow. And really, temperature is a huge factor on viscosity of any kind of material besides magma. For example, you, we put oil in our car, uh, which has a particular type of viscosity associated with that oil. And of course, when the engine heats up, heats up the oil, and then the, uh, the oil becomes a little bit more fluid moving, more fluid flow. Or how about this example? Uh, you like to put the Hershey's uh, chocolate syrup onto your ice cream and uh, you take the syrup out of the refrigerator and it doesn't flow very well. And so what do you do? You put it in the microwave and you heat that up. And when the chocolate syrup is heated in the microwave, um, because of the temperature, the viscosity now um, um, becomes more fluid. And so it gets a little bit lower. So magma would do the same thing and lava as well. So chemical composition. So not only does um, temperature influence the viscosity nature of lava, but so does the composition of the lava itself. And in particular, it's going to be affected by the content of silica, SiO2. 
and the silica is going to be high in the lava flow itself or the silica is going to be low. And we choose silica because if you um, recall in previous discussions, we learned that the most two common elements on the Earth's surface is silica and oxygen. And so we can expect then that for the most part in various types of volcanoes and in various types of magma and lava, you're going to have some appreciable uh, amounts of uh, silica or uh, silica dioxide. So mafic compositions, recall that mafic compositions are less in silica, but higher in magnesium and iron. And in fact, um, mafic compositions have somewhere around 50% silica. And so because of the low um, composition or the low concentration of silica, um, one would observe and see a fluid type flow or a low viscosity. If you have an intermediate composition uh, with about 60% silica, then the lava and the volcano itself becomes a little bit uh, higher in viscosity and the lava becomes a little bit more uh, pastier. If you have a felsic composition, and now we're talking in 70% silica or um, uh, uh, large amounts of silica, then the viscosity is going to change and the viscosity is going to become higher and you're going to end up having more of a pasty uh, type flow that emanates from the particular volcano. And so because of the different compos because of the composition differences of silica in um, volcanic lava, you're going to see different types of eruptive styles. So for example, if you look in the slide and you observe um, um, slide A and B, two distinct volcanoes, they're going to have, they have different types of uh, eruptive styles. So first of all, if you look at uh, A, in the left hand sorry, side of your screen in the upper part, this particular volcano is a high viscosity. It's high concentration in silica. It's what we call a very felsic type of volcano or felsic type uh, composition. And because of its high silica and high viscosity, <clears throat> it's now become more of a pasty uh, type uh, uh, lava uh, emission, very explosive. So these types of volcanoes then with their pasty high silica felsic compositions um, are very explosive. The slide or the picture below in B, uh, this is a type of volcano now with a low viscosity, low silica, meaning in this case it's very mafic and high concentration in iron and magnesium. So whether we're getting it, we see mafic type composition, very fluid type flow, and these particular volcanoes are very non-explosive. In fact, in the many of these types of volcano eruptions where we have a fluid um, type mafic flow, you can actually get right next to the lava flow uh, because of its non-explosive nature. And if you can uh, take the heat. Another influencing factor um, that's um, observed in magma besides uh, viscosity and temperature and silica content is dissolved gases. And recall that the term dissolved gases really means the uh, concentration of volatiles, meaning that the lava contains various uh, percentages or concentrations of water, carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide. So silica content and volatiles uh, can erupt two types of materials. And here we have, again, a low uh, magma and silica. And on the picture to the right, we have magma with high silica. Volatiles are uh, easily able to migrate upward in the uh, magma with the low silica. And so because it, um, it evolves um, uh, easier, uh, it escapes a lot uh, uh, easier and it can cause what we call uh, um, lava fountains. It's kind of analogous to you opening a can of uh, soda. If you kind of uh, take that can of soda and as you release the pressure, uh, gases uh, emit very easily. Uh, so again, lava flows fluidly. If you look to the right-hand picture, uh, volatiles that migrate uh, upward very difficultly in a magma in high silica. And so in this case, uh, the volatiles, because of its a pasty nature, 
um, in a high silica lava, uh, gases uh, become very explosive when trying to escape from the volcano. And again, if you go back to the left picture, um, it shows here that uh, when gas does make its way out of the volcano, gas will have a tendency to expand 100 times its volume. So think about that a little bit. You have gases that are uh, confined and compressed inside a volcano, and it, it equals some certain volume. And when that gas is released and uh, is emitted out into the open um, area, if you will, uh, it'll have a tendency to expand 100 times its volume. And that would be the same, same thing with the left, or, I'm sorry, the right hand photograph uh, under explosive um, uh, type situation. And again, gas will expand 100 times its volume. But remember, if, it's, if, if gas is trying to escape out of a, a high magma, um, high silica magma concentration, it's going to be very explosive as it exits. Um, the volcano, as opposed to um, magma that's low in silica, where volatiles are easily um, allowed to escape. But again, in both cases, uh, gases will expand 100 times its volume. So what types of gases um, are common on a typical um, uh, volcanic eruption? Well, we have um, uh, the magma chamber located at the bottom of your screen here. So this would be the, at the bottom of the screen. And then the volatiles, because they're less dense, will have a tendency to collect uh, at the top or above the magma chamber. So here you can see magma chamber. And here you see um, the volatiles collecting uh, in the uh, conduit or in the volcanic neck uh, part of the volcano. And then once eruption, um, the volatiles will escape the volcano in terms of dissolved gases. Again, volatiles, um, typical, typically uh, gas concentrations can range from 1% to 6% of the total magma weight. So obviously, the uh, more magma you have, uh, the more volatiles or gases um, you know, that will be part of that magma, but 1% to 6% of its total weight. And then those gases contribute to the atmosphere. And so just to give you some kind of uh, number ideas, water vapor typically is about 70% of the volatiles that erupt from a volcano. If you look over on the right hand part of your screen, we have carbon dioxide about 15%. And then nitrogen is about 5%. And sulfur dioxide, which typically uh, uh, gives the... Um, volcano, the rotten egg smell, a lot of volcanologists can tell that a vo volcano is highly active or possibly even ready to erupt based on uh, the emissions of sulfur dioxide and that rotten egg, rotten egg smell. And then, of course, we have um, hydrogen, uh, which is about less than 1%. So typically, again, when a volcanic or a volcano erupts, uh, you will see these types of uh, concentrations of volatiles. So there are two distinct types of basaltic lava flows. And when we say basaltic lava flows, we're talking about two types of lava flows that are low in silica, but high in iron and magnesium. So these types of basaltic lava flows that you're looking at then are um, um, mafic lava flows, again, low in silica. So in terms of what distinguishes the difference between these two types of lava flows is basically the dissolved gases. In other words, how many volatiles are present in that particular lava flow? And recall in the previous slide, we said typically a lava flow will have one to 6% volatiles. So just by looking at the picture, we can look at the picture to the uh, left where the arrow is on the slide and this would typically be a lava flow that's probably very high in volatiles in terms of the gases. So it's at least approaching 6%. And the lava flow uh, on the uh, right side uh, typically will be probably uh, around 1% or 2% within that range of volatile gases. So low silica content, but um, uh, the, the concentration of volatiles 
gives the characteristic of that lava flow. So the first lava flow, again, on your left part of the screen is known as a pohoihoi type lava flow. And the second lava flow on the right hand of the screen is called an aa type lava flow. So AA spelled aa <clears throat> and pohoihoi. So pohoihoi lava flows are considered very fluid, very thin. Uh, they represent these broad sheets. Uh, sometimes um, volcanologists like to give it a characteristic name of a very ropey type lava flow. These particular flows move about uh, 10 to 300 kilometers per hour. So they're pretty fast moving. Uh, you probably have to do some pretty good jogging and running if you're gonna move away from a, a pohoihoi type lava flow. And that would equate to 30 to 900 feet per hour. And again, as we mentioned earlier, the pohoihoi lava flow is, um, characterized by high volatile gas content. And again, um, texturally, it appears to have a smooth, uh, kind of a ropey skin type look. And how is that different than the ah uh -uh type flow? Well, the ah uh -uh type flow is a very pasty, sticky type flow. The ah uh -uh flow is very thick and it's a cooler flow, a lot to, uh, the temperature's a lot uh, cooler. Uh, it flows to about 5 to 50 meters per hour. And so it's a lot slower uh, flow than a pohoihoi. And it moves about 1,500 feet per hour. And again, it's characterized by the lower end of the gas content. So this is a low volatile gas content. And it's known for a very rough, blocky, uh, sharp, uh, uh, angular uh, type lava flow. Both of these typical uh, lava flows uh, occur in the Hawaiian island area, which would be one example. Now, a lot of students have a um, difficulty distinguishing the difference uh, between an aa -uh type flow versus a pohoihoi type flow. And it's really a good way to uh, learn that difference. And that is if you were barefooted and you walked on the rough, jagged, blocky, sharp type lava flow, you would say, ah, 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 therefore being your ah, ah flow. So that would be a good way to uh, learn the difference. That is a huge standing uh, uh, humor of geology. So the Pohoihoi type flow, oops, pardon me. So again, here's another example of the Pohoihoi type lava flow. And again, you can see the ropey, um, um, thin skinned nature of the flow. And you can almost envision that this flow moves pretty fast. And then here's the difference then of the ah, ah type lava flow. And clearly you can see the rough, jagged, uh, blocky, uh, uh, much slower moving type lava flow. And again, both the pohoihoi and the ah, ah type lava flow um, is primarily different, not because of composition, but, before, but because of the concentration of volatiles. So let's move now to look at types of flows that emanate from more of a felsic type composition. So these would be the different types of volcanoes that are more in line with the explosive type volcanoes. And these are known as pyroclastic materials that emanate from a typical felsic type or high silica concentration um, composition uh, volcano. Pyro basically means fire, and clastic is a term used in geology that describes pieces or fragments. So when we say pyroclastic materials, um, this basically represents uh, types of uh, fragments or materials that uh, exit the volcano. And so we're just going to go over some common um, types of materials. And one is known as volcanic bombs, which usually emanate uh, right from the um, opening or the caldera part of the volcano. And if you look at the picture in the upper right-hand corner, you'll notice that these volcanic bombs kind of emulate or take on um, a shape uh, similar to a football, for example. Meaning that if you kind of think about it, these materials that emanate or leave the volcano, they're in their liquid volcanic state. And as they're flying through the air, 
they uh, uh, slowly solidify and they take on this aerodynamic shape. And in most cases, that's uh, again, very similar to a football. So those folks who, who uh, developed the shape of a football were pretty smart because the football is very, aero, is very aerodynamic, similar to volcanic bombs. Um, another type of um, feature found on a felsic or explosive type volcano uh, are known as uh, layars or mud flows. And these are very interesting because um, the way that layars form or these huge mud flows is one has to envision uh, in a um, felsic type of volcano, um, magma rises slowly up the neck. If you watch the, uh, my mouse arrow, and as it rises to the, as the magma gets towards the, the top of the volcano, uh, magma is hot and magma begins to heat the surrounding uh, snow that typically covers a very high type volcano. And as that snow, uh, or rather magma rises, it begins to melt the snow that's, uh, that's at the very top. And of course, snow turns into liquid water. The water begins to flow and the water then as it flows down the flanks or the sides of the volcano, it will flow down uh, uh, pre-existing streams, for example. So where a volcano has these real small uh, pre-existing stream valleys, now you get huge copious amounts of uh, water from the melted snow uh, moving down the side of the volcano and it starts to uh, encompass these pre-existing pre stream valley, which is already small to begin with, but then carves it out to make it larger and so along with that, it's picking up debris, it's picking up mud, it's picking up trees, it's picking up anything and everything as it moves down the side of the, the mountain. And so here on the right-hand side of the screen, you see an example of a good layar that has moved uh, from the very top of the volcano, made its way down to the flanks, and then kind of fanned out uh, towards the bottom. Uh, this picture here with the car, this is actually one layer. So this is actually one huge mud flow uh, that has moved down the flank of the volcano. And you can see how thick it is just in one type of flow. Uh, later on in the discussion, when we get with uh, talking about living with volcanoes and talking about volcanic hazards, uh, we'll take a look at um, um, how hazardous layers can be. So of course, um, which a lot of folks hear uh, about when a typical volcanic eruption takes place is the amount of ash that's being erupted into the atmosphere. And so here, of course, is um, ash being erupted in the atmosphere. Um, ash is a, a very unique substance, if you wanna look at that, because really ash is primarily all silica dioxide. And if you recall from our discussions in minerals, what did you learn about silica dioxide? It's a very hard material. It's greater than seven on most scale of hardness. So it's very, very abrasive. And really ash is just microscopic glass, if you will. And so you can imagine uh, putting the very resistant ash type deposits up into the atmosphere, uh, what that can do uh, in terms of uh, airplanes, for example. Uh, certainly airplanes will avoid any volcanic eruption because the minute that ash uh, gets into, uh, you know, the jet uh, engine system, um, it certainly can wreak havoc um, in terms of abrasiveness. Also, during the uh, Mount St. Helens eruption, um, ash was distributed again all through the Portland area, the Tri-Cities area, and um, there were uh, several feet of ash um, that collected on tops of buildings, uh, which became very heavy, um, created problems there. Um, ash became a problem for uh, uh, car engines in terms of uh, getting some of the ash, um, you know, through the air filter, clogging the air filter up, and probably even getting some of the ash inside the engine. So ash is a very um, abrasive uh, type material. And then finally, uh, and if you look at the lower part of your uh, slide, a very common feature associated with a pyroclastic type felsic volcano would be a uh, type of um, uh, gas flow, if you will, called a nue or daunt. And here you see a picture of a nue or daunt uh, traveling down uh, the flank of the volcano. 
These new array dons can travel in excess of 200 miles per hour. And typically they represent a, a very dense um, ash cloud that's filled with volatiles. And these um, uh, clouds, again, are so dense that as instead of uh, being ejected into the atmosphere uh, and because of their density property, they have a, a, a tendency to roll down the flanks. And so again, in this lower, um, uh, for lower slide here, you can see a picture of a new ray daunt um, making its way down the side of the volcano. And again, these uh, ash clouds are hot, very hot, and they move very, very fast. Um, types of magmas associated with a, um, a felsic type of uh, composition, high silica, a pyroclastic volcano, or what we are known as rhyolitic magmas, for example, because earlier in the previous slide, we looked at basaltic magmas, low in silica, and here we're looking at uh, rhyolitic magmas, which are high in silica. High silica, very explosive, uh, thick and pasty, um, high viscosity, and pyroclastic ejections. So rhyolitic magmas have all of the pyroclastic types of eruptions and features associated with them. And then here is another picture uh, just showing another um, uh, volcanic eruption. And here it looks like on your right hand side, you have another Nuri Daunt uh, type of uh, uh, ash cloud flowing down the flank of the volcano. And if you look in your picture, you can see a vehicle, I'm assuming driving very fast to get away from the Nuri Daunt. And then here you see a person actually you know, running away from the uh, New York Don. I hope they made it. Volcano morphology. So when we say volcano morphology, we're basically referring to um, the features of a volcano. And as I was uh, lecturing in the last uh, couple slides, I mentioned a few of the terms. So some of the terms that you should be familiar with um, of course, would be uh, something uh, flank, and flank, of course, represents the sides of the volcano. Um, the crater, which represents the very top of the volcano, where lava flows typically will, um, um, you know, emit from. Um, sometimes we have a what we call a parasitic cone. This is where uh, there's a weakness in the side of the volcano or the flank of the volcano. Magma makes its way up, breaks through the weakness and forms a little smaller volcano, basically on the side of the volcano. Uh, conduit is an important term. Conduit basically represents the, um, uh, the pipe, if you will, of the volcano, certainly allowing the uh, magma to move up from the magma chamber uh, through the conduit, from the conduit. Um, some of these other um, um, features like this uh, feature called a dike, a sill, a dike is a type of feature in which the magma uh, is cutting across the layers. So here's a layer of the volcano. There's a layer. There's a layer. And the dike is cutting across. Another term is sill, which basically parallels the, uh, the uh, layers of the volcano. 